Hey guys, this is Bjorn Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about Viacom CBS. Viacom CBS is an American diversified multinational mass media and entertainment company. In this video, we'll go over the company's business by going over its 10K, then review the company's fundamentals by going over its key ratios, and finally find the intrinsic value of the company using the discounted free cash flow decent analysis as well as the dividend discount model. So let's dive in and review Viacom CBS. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at the Form 10K, which is the annual report that Viacom CBS filed with the SEC. On page 3 of this report, the company starts off by giving us a business overview. It states that Viacom CBS is a leading global media and entertainment company that creates premium content and experiences for audiences worldwide. Its portfolio includes CBS, Showtime, Paramount Pictures, Nickelodeon, MTV, Comedy Central, BET, Smithsonian Channel, CBS All Access, and Pluto TV. In the next paragraph, Viacom states that through the synergistic combination of its studios, networks, and streaming businesses, it strategically focuses on creating value in three ways. First, by maximizing the power of its content by leveraging its extensive intellectual property portfolio across the company and by focusing on areas with potential growth. Second, by maximizing value from its biggest lines of revenues, which are advertising, affiliate, and content licensing. And lastly, Viacom CBS is accelerating its momentum in streaming by expanding its differentiated ecosystem of free, pay, and premium streaming services to capitalize on the global opportunity in streaming. Now let's look at the three operating segments that the company has outlined in this report. It states that it operates through the following segments. The first one is the TV entertainment segment. The TV entertainment segment operates CBS Television Network, CBS Studio, and CBS Media Ventures, CBS Branded Streaming Services, CBS Sports Network, and CBS Television Stations. The TV entertainment segment accounted for approximately 42% of the company's consolidated revenue in 2020. The second business segment is the cable networks segment, which operates a portfolio of streaming services, premium subscription cable networks, and basic cable networks. The cable network segment accounted for approximately 50% of the company's consolidated revenue in 2020. And finally, the third and last operating segment is the filmed entertainment segment, which operates Paramount Pictures, Paramount Players, Paramount Animation, and Paramount Television Studios. This operating segment accounted for approximately 10% of the company's consolidated sales in 2020. Now let's look at the revenue breakdown across these three operating segments, which the company has outlined on page 142. Over here, we can see that the TV entertainment segment brought in about $10.7 billion. The cable network segment brought in about $12.6 billion. And the filmed entertainment segment brought in about $2.6 billion in the year 2020. And if we zoom into each operating segment, we can see that the advertising brought in majority of the TV entertainment revenue. The affiliate brought in majority of the cable network's revenue. And finally, licensing brought in majority of the film entertainment revenue. Now that we have a brief understanding of the company's business and its three operating segments, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, I'm on Morningstar looking at Viacom CBS. Viacom has two classes of shares, Class A and Class B. Class A has voting rights, that is one share of Class A equates to one vote, and Class B does not have any voting rights. Fundamentally, it does not matter if it's Class C or Class B shares, as it's still the same company, Viacom CBS. Looking at the key ratios, I'm on financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, the company's revenue was about $14 billion, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $27 billion. Over the past 10 years, the company's revenue stayed fairly consistent from 2011 through 2018. That is, its revenue hovered between $13 to $15 billion range. And then the company's revenue went up in the year 2019. And ever since then, the company's revenue has stayed fairly steady. Next, looking at the operating income. The operating income is the amount of money that's left with the company once we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, the company's operating income was about $2.6 billion. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $4.8 billion. Over the past 10 years, we can see that the company's operating income follows a similar trend as the company's revenue. Next is the net income. The net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it pays for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, the company's net income was about $1.3 billion. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $3.3 billion. Over the past 10 years, the company's net income was always positive, which means the company has always reported a profit. Ideally, we want to see the company's net income, operating income, and revenue to have a similar trend. In other words, if we see that a company is making higher sales, that is higher revenue, then we want to see those numbers trickle down all the way to the company's net income numbers. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2011, the company paid out about $0.35 cent per share as dividend. 
And for the trailing 12 months, that dividend payout was about $0.96 cent per share. Over the past 10 years, Viacom CBS has not only paid out consistent dividends, but the dividend payouts have been trending upwards. Next, looking at the shares outstanding. Back in 2011, the company had 681 million shares outstanding. And for the trailing 12 months, it had 638 million shares outstanding. When we look at the past 10 year trend, we can see that the company's shares outstanding decreased all the way down to about 448 million shares back in 2016. And then the company issued more shares, hence the company's shares outstanding number went up in the year 2017. When we look at the year 2020, the company had 618 million shares outstanding. And just in March of 2020, the company said that it's going to issue more shares in order to finance its growth internationally. And that's why we see an addition of 20 million shares for the trailing 12 month figure. Ideally, we want the company's shares outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. When a company buys back its shares, the share count numbers go down, and this actually helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. Next, looking at the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. So the book value is the shareholders' equity. Back in 2012, the company's book value was about $16.2 per share, and for the train 12 months, that number was about $31.8 per share. Over the past 10 years, the company's book value was always positive, which tells us that the company always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. It's important to note that this book value per share includes the company's intangible assets. So if there's an impairment, then it can drastically bring down the company's book value per share. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the company's capital spending from its operating cash flow. Back in 2011, the company's free cash flow was $1,484 million. And for the trailing 12 months, that number was about $1,036 million. Over the past 10 years, the company's free cash flow was always positive, which tells us that the company's operating cash flow was always greater than its capital spending. I will be using the trailing 12-month figure of $1,036 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 9.16%, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 12%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in sales over the past 12 months, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had $12 left as pure profit. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity is the ratio of the company's income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, the company's return on equity was about 13%. And for the train 12 months, that number was about 19%. Over the past 10 years, the company's return on equity has always been greater than 8%. The three ways to reporting higher return on equity numbers is first by reporting higher income numbers. Second is by buying back shares, that is decreasing the company's equity. And third is by taking on more leverage. Next, looking at the return on invested capital. This number gives us an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was about 9.96%, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about 10.88%. The company's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 8.4%. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than its weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that Viacom's management is creating value for its shareholders. Finally, looking at the interest coverage, the interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest using its income in that calendar year. Back in 2011, the company's interest coverage was about six times, and for the trailing 12 months, that number was about five times. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had an interest coverage of five times or higher. Now let's look at the financial health and liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. A current ratio of 1.0 tells us that the company has enough assets to fulfill its liabilities over the next 12 months. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.0. It's even better if it's greater than 1.5. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was at 1.41, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.66. Next is the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. A quick ratio greater than 1.0 tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was at 1.0, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.28. Both the current and quick ratios indicate that the company is liquid and can easily survive for the next 12 months. Next, looking at the financial leverage. The financial leverage is the ratio of the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A financial leverage of 1.0 tells us that all of the company's assets are financed via its shareholders' equity. 
A higher financial leverage tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via its liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's financial leverage was at 2.64, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.72. Over the past 10 years, Viacom CBS's financial leverage was highest back in 2017 when it was at 10.57, and ever since then, the company's financial leverage has slowly been trending downwards. Finally, looking at the debt to equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want to see the company's debt to equity ratio to be less than 1.0. Back in 2011, the company's debt to equity was at 0.60, and for the latest quarter, it's at 0.93. The company's debt to equity ratio has a similar trend as the company's financial leverage. That is, the company's debt to equity ratio was at its highest back in 2017, and ever since then, it has been trending downwards. Now, let's look at the company's efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives us an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sale to the date it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2011, the company's day sales outstanding was about 83 days, and for the trading 12 months, that number was about 90 days. Ideally, we want to see the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose day sales outstanding number is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company's management is being aggressive with its accounting as it's recognizing its revenue sooner so that it can inflate its income numbers on its income statement. In the case of Viacom CBS, the company's day sales outstanding number has mostly hovered in the 90 to 100 days range, so it does not appear that the management is playing any such accounting tricks. Next, looking at the day's inventory, this number gives an idea of how many days does the company's product send in its inventory before it's sold. Back in 2011, the company's day's inventory was about 32 days, and for the training 12 months, that number was about 38 days. Ideally, we want the company's day's inventory number to be staying steady or decreasing. Next, looking at the payables period. This number gives us an idea of how many days does the company take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, the company's payables period was about 18.5 days, and for the trained 12 months, that number was about 14 days. Ideally, we want the company's payables period to be staying steady or decreasing. What we do not want to see is a company whose payables period is growing rapidly, as that tells us that the company is holding on to its cash in order to artificially inflate its cash flow numbers on its cash flow statement. Viacom CBS's payables period over the past 10 years has hovered in the 8 to 18 days range. Now let's look at the company's current valuation. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Viacom's PE is at 6.2. The company's price to book is at 1.0. The company's price to sales is at 0.7. The company's price to cash flow is at 13.9. And finally, Viacom CBS has a dividend yield of 3.2%. When we compare Viacom CBS's current valuation to that of its five-year average, we can see that on all the valuation metrics, the company is currently undervalued. And if you look at the S&P 500, and the S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States, and it is a good proxy for our opportunity cost. We can see that Viacom CBS's current valuation is still undervalued when compared to that of the S&P 500. Now let's look at Viacom CBS's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted the company's string 12-month free cash flow that I got from Morningstar, which was at $1,036 million. I'm using an annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 10%. What this means is I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 10% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%. What this means is I want this investment to give me an annual 10% return. I'm using a long-term growth rate of 1.9%. What this means is after the 10-year mark into perpetuity, I expect the company's free cash flow to grow at 1.9%. The 1.9% is in line with the 30-year treasury yield. The company has 638 million shares outstanding and has a long-term debt of $19,717 million. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $5.76 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price at $30.18 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading about five times its intrinsic value. Now, if we drop the company's discount rate to its weighted average cost of capital, which is how business schools like to look at it, then we get the company's intrinsic value to be about $16.6 .6 per share. And in this case, the company is trading about 1.8 times the intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows, which come out to about $11 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10-year mark in perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $30 billion. From this number, we subtract the long-term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value per share to be about $17. Now, if you disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if you think that Viacom CBS is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get a negative number, primarily because the company has such a big number for its long-term debt, which makes the company's intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be a negative number.
Now, if we disregard the debt, in other words, if you think that Viacom CBS is going to grow into perpetuity, so there's no point for the company to worry about paying off its debt, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $48 per share. So we can see that the long-term debt is what's holding back Viacom from getting a higher intrinsic value. If we drop the company's discount rate to zero, again, we get the same number that we just got over here. Now, if we increase the discount rate to 10%, which is what we had initially, then we can see that the company's intrinsic value is about $37 per share. And in this case, the company's current stock is trading about 12% below the company's intrinsic value. Now, let's find Viacom's intrinsic value using the dividend discount model. Over here, I pasted the dividends that the company paid out over the past 10 years. This is the year-over-year -year change that the company's dividends saw over the past 10 years. It is safe to assume that the company's dividend is going to grow at about 9% annually for the next five years. And after the five-year mark in perpetuity, we expect the company's dividend to grow at 6%. And so in order to calculate the company's terminal value, we are using the dividend growth rate to be 6% and using a discount rate of 10%. After taking all of these dividend payments into account using a 10% discount rate, we get our net present value to be about $27 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the company's current stock price, which is about $30.18 per share, we can see that the company's current stock is trading at a premium of about 12.8%. Now, if we drop the company's discount rate to 8.4%, which is its weighted average cost of capital, we can see that in this case, the company's intrinsic value is now at $45 per share. And in this case, the company's current stock is trading about 33% below its intrinsic value. So overall, we saw that Viacom CBS has good fundamentals. However, the company has a lot of long-term debt, which brings down the company's intrinsic value. The company is undervalued when compared to its five-year average and is undervalued when we drop the company's discount rate to its weighted average cost of capital. Viacom CBS is investing heavily to grow internationally. And as we saw over the past 12 months, the company issued about 20 million shares in order to finance their international growth. Lastly, it's important to note that Viacom CBS operates in the entertainment industry, which is highly competitive. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Viacom CBS interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions on which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I'll greatly appreciate it. Thank you.